Aesthetic surgery, it's more than just trying to make a person look good. It also has a lot to do with making them feel better and function better. Stay with us as we talk about what's new in plastic surgery. Kentucky Health addresses the health care concerns of all residents of Kentucky and surrounding states. It was created by Dr. Wayne Tuxen, a colorectal surgeon practicing in Louisville. Here is your host, Dr. Wayne Tuxen. Hi, and welcome to another segment of Kentucky Health. Today we're going to talk about plastic surgery, specifically aesthetic surgery, improving the way we look and hopefully impacting on the way we feel. With us today is Dr. Nana Mizuguchi, who's with Calabrese Plastic Surgery Center. Nana, thanks for being with us again. Welcome, Dr. Tuxon. Seems like you and I have been talking about this for a long time already. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, you know, it's exactly what you said. Back in the 80s, plastic surgery was really thought of as only for the rich and the wealthy and the movie stars. And as a matter of fact, Joan Rivers recently made a comment about that, and she made millions of dollars making fun of herself having plastic surgery. But today, she said, you know, if she came out with those jokes today, nobody would laugh because plastic surgery is very common and it's very available and it is affordable for many people today. And there's, there's a significant impact or improvement, not just on their, you know, physical appearance, mm -hmm. but also on their emotional well-being. Now, I've seen a lot of people talk about doing, and I should say in quotations, plastic surgery. Uh, and I wonder, are they really plastic surgeons, or they've really been trained in this sort of thing. You know, you hear the aesthetic surgeon, this and that. Who should we be looking at if we want to get something done? I think that, you know, you bring up a really good point. You know, plastic surgery is a very, very complicated field. Mm -hmm. um, it is very difficult to, it's different than, for example, taking a gallbladder out, which is, can also be a very difficult procedure in itself. Um, trying to make somebody look good or pretty it's very difficult because it depends on the person who's looking at you. So um, I think that you definitely want someone who's well trained. Mm -hmm. You definitely want to have someone who has some board certification and, and I would recommend someone who's board certified in plastic surgery. Um, and also look at their credentials, mm -hmm. look at their before and after pictures, look at their um, or talk to patients that have had surgeries or procedures from these uh, other so-called experts, mm -hmm. and then, you know, make your decisions wisely. What is to be expected during that initial evaluation uh, when you're first meeting that person they come in to you? What's that interchange like? You know, fortunately, I have really, really great and wonderful patients, and, and it's, they come with, usually come with a specific problem, and they don't like their neck, or they don't like the size of their breasts, or they don't like their tummy after they've had um, some babies and such, so they have, usually have a very specific problems. I usually rarely have patients that come in and say, oh, "Where should I start?" Mm -hmm. And and so because they have specific problems, it's really easy for me to focus in on to those things. And clearly, if they have issues with that, then I can help them with those problems. Now, freak, sometimes you see a patient who comes in and complains with something like their neck, and their neck looks perfectly fine. Mm -hmm. And obviously, we have to, I have to figure out what other problems that they're dealing with. So. Should the patient expect um, photographs they're going to be taking of them while they're there in the office? Well, during the initial consultations, um, usually there will not be any photographs taken of that specific patient. Mm -hmm. Now, frequently when we do a nose job, mm -hmm. nose job is one procedure where you can do some photo manipulation to show them what they potentially could look like in the future. And so it's sometimes beneficial for the patients, but, but for most other procedures we don't take mm -hmm. pictures at that time. I have this vision of you're sitting in the office and someone comes in with a picture and says, I want to look like this. <laughs> no one's going to come in with a picture of me saying they want to look like me, but I mean, you know, it, so how does that work? I mean, is that what somebody does? Um, that's really actually infrequent, even though it would seem like that's what somebody would do. Mm -hmm. I see that happen probably less than a few percentage of the time. Most people come in with very realistic expectations of what's possible. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, with, again, going to uh, nose jobs, 
or rhinoplasty, uh, they will bring someone else's nose, a picture of some movie star's nose, and say they want to look like that. And obviously, that's not something that's really even humanly possible. Even if it was, quite frequently, that nose will not fit correctly on your particular face. Mm. So these are the kind of things that, fortunately, my nurses are very well trained at, at my center, and um, they kind of go over all this before I even talk to them. Wow. So um, I get a pretty well informative and well-educated patient. Well, you were kind enough to bring in um, some photographs of some patients that you've treated on, and with their permission, uh, to allow us to take a look at them. And I'd like to remind our viewers, we'll be looking at um, some body parts. Uh, I don't think anything should be found offensive, but I do want to tell you that we are talking about a healthcare show, and we're going to talk about reconstructive surgery. So with this first person, what is it that we're looking at on this slide, if you could tell, describe what we're looking at? So the face that they have is what, on the left-hand okay. side of that screen is what? Right, so the left-hand side of the screen is the before picture, and in the, in the right-hand side of the screen is the after picture. And this is a, a really, really wonderful lady who complained about, you can see on the next picture, about her neck primarily. And also she just had this very tired appearance. Mm -hmm. And so for her, when I, whenever I talk about facial aging, you know, there's three aspects that I really focus on. And one is the quality of the patient's skin. Mm -hmm. You know, young people have that beautiful glow in their skin, and mm -hmm. we kind of forget that. And, and so the first and most important thing, obviously, is to protect their skin, and then do some type of skin, skin treatments, whether it's topical agents or chemical peels or lasers, to improve the quality of their skin. The second thing is to deal with the relative excess skin that they have, and mm -hmm. it usually collects down in the neck, mm -hmm. neck area, and that's usually a surgical procedure in Generally, it's some type of a facelift. And lastly, this is something that's really evolved since I've been in practice, is, that, is the emphasis on replacing volume. And all you have to do is look at young people, look at your children and mm -hmm. such, and you'll notice that young people have much more volume in the upper part of our face. And it really wasn't until recently that we had a lot of different products that are available today. When I started my practice in 2003, basically there was Botox, which was a neural toxin, which mm -hmm. helps to paralyze muscles, and great for the frown lines and the, around your eyes and such. And there was collagen, which really didn't last very long, it lasted maybe two to three months, and people didn't really like to be stuck every two to three months. You're just injecting this under injecting the skin? Injecting under wow. the skin, uh -huh. right. And then first um, came the hyaluronic acids, mm -hmm such as Restylane and later Juvederm and such, um, that really, they were much longer lasting. And I think patients became more comfortable with using needles to mm. obtain a better look. Mm. And from there, because of that availability of different injectables, I was able to use these products to increase volume in the upper part of the face. And this is actually something, not necessarily new, mm -hmm. but using something that's very reliable, like an injectable, is great. They're not permanent, they don't last forever. There are a variety of products that last, may, may last anywhere from a year to several years. Wow. Um, the best thing is that they're forgiving, mm -hmm. they're reproducible, um, and to some degree they are correctable. And some of some products like the hyaluronic acids, you can actually inject a chemical that will make it go away if you absolutely hate it. Mm. So it's a very flexible procedure and it's, and it's a completely done in an in I'm sorry, in-office procedure. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes we put topicals on. Today, these both the the almost all the products today come with local in them already. Mm -hmm. So that really helps with the pain level oh. and such. So. What about the old facelift when you're just kind of pulling things back? You mentioned Joan Rivers, I guess, you know, right. so far. That's so, not done? Well it's still done, uh -huh. but it's done in a much more gentler and kinder way. And you know, um, a lot of facelifts done in the 80s got a pretty bad name because everybody looked like they were really pulled tight mm -hmm. and they looked kind of funny, they looked alien-like. And But today, things are done in a different way. Um, the pull of the skin is up in a much more upward tension, so it's a much more natural way as opposed to in the side. Uh. And, and you know, you're not trying to pull something as tight as you can because you know what skin does, when you pull that skin, all it does is stretches mm -hmm. and gives in. So it doesn't necessarily, there is really not that much of a benefit by pulling someone really tight. So today, facelifts are much better done because it's done in a much more natural way. So you try to f make the face fuller again. Exactly, uh, like, exactly. Well, and nice. the fillers have really helped now. Certainly, fat grafting can also is available and has always been available and mm -hmm. can help too. Um, and fat grafting is something that's going to be much 
better in the future as what, well. What's fat grafted? Where do you get this fat? So the fat is harvested pretty much anywhere, any part of your body. Oh, but if you're doing a face person. from oh. the same person, yes, mm -hmm. and usually it's taken from their stomach or from their hips, or from I'm sorry, or from their thighs, mm -hmm. and it is spun down in a certain fashion, mm -hmm. and and that fat is used to place back into the face. Mm -hmm. Now traditionally, you know, there's been some controversy about how much fat will be absorbed and and sometimes it could be lumpy and such, but with more advanced techniques and in the future we can look for stem cells and such that will enhance the fat survival rates and can have a significant impact because harvesting your own fat, mm -hmm. you know, it's a lot cheaper than using a product that some pharmaceutical company uh, has made. Yeah. So, because mm -hmm. most people, not most people, some people have plenty of fat to mm -hmm. uh, donate. And in the face you don't need very much. You need a few cc's. So. Well, that was a very kind way of putting it, Talk, not calling the rest of us all fat. Now, another, you have another slide here showing someone's arms. I know as many of us get older, particularly you see it, I guess, in, more often in women than, I guess, men, we get these little droopy arm bit coming down, or I guess even people who undergo weight reduction don't right. even have some of that droopiness right. under the arm. So what are we seeing here? So on, again, on the left side is the before picture, and you can see that arm that's hanging down, it's like a bat wing. Mm -hmm. And on the l right side is the after picture after what, what the procedure called arm reduction or brachyplasty. Mm. And in that procedure, you do have an incision that goes along the bottom part of your arm and it goes down into your axilla. Uh, but you can see the significant improvement on that. Does that doesn't limit the person's movement of the arm at all? Just still moves pretty? Moves pretty? beautifully. It sh they do very well. What's nice about that particular procedure Traditionally, the incision was placed in the inner arm, uh -huh. and believe it or not, that inner arm, if you notice that skin on that inner arm is very thin, yeah. so the scars would end up being like an inch wide. Mm -hmm. So yes, their arms were smaller, but they had a scar that was an inch wide that was very hard to hide. Every time you raise your arm, you can see right, it. Right. So now the scar is placed in the back, oh. and for Dr. Tuxon, the only time he would see it is if someone was going to bash him in his head, okay? So, <laughs> Thank you <for> that. <laughs> so it's really actually a, a well-hidden scar, mm -hmm. and it's a really nice procedure, and it's, it's more commonly done on weight loss patients, as you mentioned. Usually, generally on patients who haven't lost that much weight, mm -hmm. liposuction may be a better alternative. Mm -hmm. Is that something that's still done now, liposuction? Liposuction is done very frequently, and it's also, today we have a, a newer technique where I get to use a laser, mm. and the laser really helps to tighten that skin mm -hmm. because the quality of the skin in your arm isn't that great, but mm -hmm. just touching that laser along the undersurface of the skin can help, it help that skin contract better, and you can have a much better result. Well, you mentioned that. The, the next slide you have is showing a tummy tuck, and I seem to remember people used to do what, liposuction even to get rid of some unwanted extra fat down there, but wh what is actually going on in a tummy tuck okay. procedure? Okay. So in a tummy tuck procedure, you know, usually it's for s someone who's either had a, a major weight loss or someone after having multiple babies or even a single baby. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, you're trying to get rid of the excess stretched out skin. Mm -hmm. And liposuction is still a very, very important component of, of a tummy tuck. Mm -hmm. And it's done to really improve the upper part of your, the, the abdomen, mm -hmm. the belly area, and also on the sides. And the, the other aspect of tummy tuck is that you do tighten the muscle. Oh. And frequently after having pregnancies or having a, uh, excessive weight, mm -hmm. your tummy tuck, I'm sorry, your muscles can stretch out. Ah. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people can get what's called a rectus diastasis or it looks like they think they have a hernia. It's not really a hernia, just the weakness on their abdominal wall. And with a tummy tuck, you can sew those muscles back together and really get a better waistline. Mm -hmm. Now. I know a lot of people want to know this must be a very painful procedure, and, and certainly I think it was, and this is another great change that has occurred since I've practiced, mm -hmm. I started practice, that is that we use a thing called a pain pump, mm -hmm. and it's this incredible thing where it actually, it's passed through your skin into those muscles, and it, it, it gives a, a local anesthetic, and it is amazing the pain difference, and today a tummy tuck is an outpatient procedure as patients go home. When I first started, mm -hmm patients would stay at least a minimum one night, and it was hard to even get them out of the bed after the first day. But today, people go home. They get themselves in the wheelchair, and then we wheel them right out, and they get in the car, and, and they go home, and they do great. And, and I think that's one of a significant improvement for a tummy tuck type procedure. Wow. Now, I, I understand that, well, you have the tummy tuck. I, I've, I've heard, though, that some people now want to get, uh, since there's this great emphasis on how we look, a six pack, you can get something done to the muscles to make them 
appear more prominent in the belly? <laughs> well, if you, if you really focus on how you do that liposuction or the contouring part, mm -hmm. um, you can improve and get that kind of shape that you're looking for. Now, it is a much more complicated procedure and it's not, it's not as predictable. Mm -hmm. um, certainly, you can end up with contour irregularities and certainly um, weight fluctuations can alter the way you look. So, generally, it's not performed. Okay. Uh, but certainly, I think that you can leave certain fat behind to make it look like that your abdominal muscles are much strong or bigger than it is. I think when a lot of us think about um, aesthetic surgery, once we get past the face, I think the next thing seems to be breast, either making breasts smaller or making them larger. But I think larger seems to be the ones I hear more about. What's going on with that. Now, I know you brought along some products here. Can you tell me a little bit about that and some of the techniques that you have available to you for uh, altering the shape of the breast? Sure. Uh, you know, I have three sets of implants here today. Mm -hmm. And one of the nicest things that's happened since I've been in practice, again, this is something new since 2003, is that the silicone gel breast implant, which is this particular implant here, mm -hmm. has been reintroduced back to the general market for breast augmentations. Mm -hmm. Now, it has been available for a study purpose for people who, have, who need breast reconstruction or people who need a breast lift. Mm -hmm. But for just straightforward breast augmentation, it's been available since about 2006 and has really changed the practice because this implant is a great implant for, mm -hmm. for women. It looks and feels more natural. And as you can see, some of this is a saline breast implant, which is a great breast implant and, it, and certainly does the job, will give you larger breasts. But it does have some problems, and mainly you can see when these implants are sitting up, this implant wants to collapse. Yes. And many women who come for, for breast augmentation are, compl are complaining that they don't have any volume in the upper part of the breast. Mm -hmm. So the silicone breast implant really helps. So that keeps its shape a little bit more exactly. compared to that. And as you can see, because of the saline implant, just because of the nature of this implant, mm -hmm. if you have really thin skin, you may be able to feel the edges of this implant, or, uh, or you may be able to feel the ridges of the implant. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. silicone implant will will significantly decrease the risk of that. Mm -hmm. Now this is the third type of implant. This is the cohesive gel or, or the gummy bear implant. Um, this is still an investigational uh, mm -hmm. implant. I am a, a clinical investigator for this implant. It is used primarily for breast reconstruction and for people who had who need revisional breast surgery. And this is silicone as well, mm -hmm. but it's much more stiffer, much mm -hmm. more like a gummy bear. Mm -hmm. And you can see that it maintains the yes, upper pull yes. even better. Yeah. And it has even less wrinkling. So people who have severe wrinkling, for example, if you have breast augmentation with saline initially and you have wrinkling, and then you switch to silicone and there, you can still feel the edges, then this implant potentially could be a good implant. The downfall for this implant it is a little bit firmer mm -hmm. implant than this particular implant. What about the old tram flaps? Or uh, That's gone the way of the dodo? Or? <laughs> well, for breast reconstruction, mm -hmm. I still think that autologous or using tram flaps, using your own body tissue is still the That's best. That's bringing what, the, the rectus you, muscle up? And, exactly, uh -huh. correct. Now, today there are much more sophisticated procedures like a free tram or, or they call it a deep procedure where they're actually not even taking any part of the muscle. Hmm and they take it completely off your body and reposition it back up to your chest. Now again, this is f primarily done for breast mm -hmm. reconstruction, and I still feel that that's the best way to do breast reconstruction. However, there is a, there is a severe, there's a small window of people that really qualify for that. If you're too thin, you don't have enough tissue. Mm -hmm. If you're too big, then you have too much tissue, and it's too hard for that blood supply to, to be adequate to survive, sure. for that flap to survive. Now, when you put these in, what do you, you, you slide them in uh, in surgery, or how do you get these okay. in? Um, certainly, there are many different incision points for mm -hmm. a breast augmentation, and uh, the primary one I use is at the fold, but there are other incisions for such what? Under, under the breast fold. Breast yes, under the breast mm -hmm. fold, and certainly you can place it through the areola, through mm -hmm. the areola, or through your arm. Now, saline breast. One of the advantages of saline is that you can, since these come, they don't come pre-filled. Mm. I actually can fold them in, so you can get them through a much smaller incision. Oh. And after they're in, there's a little valve here mm -hmm. that I actually put the implant, add the volume through it. And that's another advantage of saline implant is that if you have a little differences, I can add and correct that small differences while silicone comes pre-filled and they're set on their sizes. Okay. Now silicone, because it, is, it comes pre-filled, it does require a little bigger implant at our center at the Calabrese Plastic. So you got to make a little bit bigger incision. Bigger down incision, there, put right. That in there. I see. At the Calabrese Plastic Surgery Center, we do have, for certain cases, uh, for if we want to try to minimize that incision, especially mm -hmm. in someone who has a very small chest wall, mm -hmm. there is a special sleeve that we can use to mm -hmm. actually place that implant in. Oh. 
And so that can that can make it. And it, you know, it's, there's certainly you have to have an incision to have this procedure, mm -hmm. and certainly these implants have to f be able to, to fit in it. And certainly with this type of implant, you have to have an even a bigger incision because mm -hmm. this is a much stiffer implant and much harder to get it in. Now, j j just looking at this, this seems to be the more realistic uh, shape because um, breasts will sag some, but those seem to sag more than right. unanticipated right. Uh, normal breasts would. So certainly, you know. Certainly, because these implants are placed under the muscle now, the other option is to put the implant on top of the muscle, mm -hmm. okay? But I think the best option is to put it under the muscle, and you can see just by placing it under the muscle, it creates this kind of tear, mm -hmm. teardrop kind of shape. So it does naturally create a teardrop type shape. Now, you did bring up another good point, which is that in the long run, this type of implant in the future maybe, hopefully will be available. I don't know when it will be available. It's available in Europe. Um, and there's other types of breast implants that are similar to this that will be available maybe in the future uh, that may actually be better because it tends to maintain that shape so it doesn't put so much pressure on the bottom part of that breast. Okay. Let me ask you now, uh, you, you, you've alluded to it a couple of times, but what is different about plastic surgery today versus say just five years ago? That's great, you know, for breast surgery for us, the biggest thing, like I've talked to you right now, is the reintroduction of the silicone gel breast implant. But another thing for us is the ability to use imaging to try to predict what you potentially could look like after having a breast augmentation. Mm -hmm. And in our place at, at our cosmetic breast center, we have a device where a woman will come in and they would stand in front of this and they will instantly take a 3D image. And from that, through a computer analysis and such, they will have a 3D image of you and then you get to select the size implants that you want, mm. and you can see a progression of different size implants. Now we still do the traditional method is where we try the implants on top of, on top of your chest over a bra, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, un under a bra, and then we come back and look and see what size that you would like to be on this device. But it's, it's, it's actually a very nice way. It's just another way for patients to be able to see what they look like, because the biggest question they always have is, what am I gonna look like? And, and it's hard to predict, mm -hmm. but this device is actually pretty good at predicting what you'll look like. Does that work for other things, for the face or the tummy things too? Um, you know, with photo manipulation, you can do for the tummy and the face, but it's, I'm sorry, yeah, you can do it for the face, like in the neck and such, but it's just a little bit more complicated. This, this procedure that we're doing for the breast is actually calculated like mm -hmm. a speci for the specific oh, implant by a specific implant maker to the level of even the different types of the implant that device maker would make, mm -hmm. not only just saline, but silicone, but the sizes and shapes. So, so that's a little bit different than me saying, well, let, I can take down that nose a little bit, or I can curve in that instead, you know, it doesn't really quantify, I'm taking away, you know, 500 cc's of fat from your thighs here. It doesn't really quantify, you're just kind of drawing it. Right? So your answer to the question of plastic surgery is really about fluff, you agree? I disagree. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, what's interesting is that, you know, you brought up the fact that the way you look can potentially improve not only yourself, just the way you feel about yourself, but may give you better opportunities for jobs. And one of the things that they found that during this hard recession period, actually people are coming to seek more plastic surgery because they want to look good and compete with younger people. Hmm. So if it's just fluff, I don't think they would be doing that. And certainly, you know, we've been seeing this movie stars and such for a long time. I mean, I mean, I mean, if, if they didn't have plastic surgery, I'm sure they probably wouldn't have gotten a lot of their, their jobs, you know. Mm. A lot of this is done as an outpatient? I would say 99% of cosmetic surgery done today at our practice mm -hmm. is outpatient surgery. And that's, we, we are very strict about what we're able to do. We try to minimize the amount of anesthesia time. Mm -hmm. We don't like to, there's a set time. Usually it's about five hours. We're a little bit more liberal on the face because it's a little bit safer. We look at your health condition. We're trying to do something that's very safe and safety is no question, Dr. Calabrese and I, we emphasize safety. Um, I, this isn't a co completely an elective procedure, mm -hmm. so safety is the most important thing. And then, and that really determines how and what type of procedures that can be done. That sounds good. You know, it, it's, on the surface we talk about aesthetic surgery and, and, and one may say, well, that's, does, does a person really need it? We see the movie stars and we kind of make fun of them. We talk about people who made fortunes off having had their plastic surgery and, and, and as you talked about Joan Rivers. But on the other hand, when you look at what the reconstructive surgeons, and plastic surgeons like Dr. Mizuguchi do, it is about how we view ourselves. And that is such an important thing because this is the face that we put out to the public. 
and it kind of tells you, you know, what we are. And it's important that people feel good about themselves. And there really isn't anything wrong about someone trying to feel good. I do recommend that if you're interested in more information about this, you try to contact Dr. Mizuguchi at the Calabrese Plastic Surgery Center, and the number of course is below, or contact your primary care physician or other plastic surgeons that you may be aware of. If it's something that you're interested in doing, get expert opinion about it. I'd like to thank you for being with us. If you want to contact us, please reach us at KentuckyHealth at InsightBB.com. And again, Dr. Mizuguchi, thank you, and thank you all again. Thank you.